I'm really happy to speak here today as a member of European Parliament, but also on behalf of the European Parliament's intergroup for coasts, coastal areas, seas, islands and rivers, where I'm a vice president in charge of European islands. Firstly, allow me to shortly introduce to you the work of our intergroup. It brings together as many as 90 representatives from 21 member states and different political groups. All in all, that's more than 10 percentage of the composition of the European Parliament coming from more than two thirds of EU member states. It maybe sounds like fun fact, but it's the first ever official body of the European Parliament that has island composition in it. Since its establishment, we organized 18 public events, conferences and lectures, which brought together over 1,000 participants. Just last year in March, following the adoption of European Parliament resolution of islands, we organized a conference on islands and cohesion policy, how to take into account the specific characteristics of the islands. Next week, we plan a follow-up conference entitled European Union Investments in Islands, dedicated to European Union support mechanisms for investment. This conference aims to discuss how island territories can contribute to the impact of the EU investment policies and instruments, such as European Fund for Strategic Investment, popular Juncker's Fund, on the ground and reach out to citizens more efficiently. I am pleased Madame Maupertieu will join us there as a speaker. This debate today is coming as a best introduction to it. Europe is a continent with a higher ratio of coast to landmass than any other, providing European Union with a remarkable diversity of thousands of its inhabited and uninhabited islands. Including intra and extra European islands, over 500 populated EU islands have an overall population of approximately 17 million people. It would be 11th most populated member states if combined. I think it was a big injustice having no official institution dedicated especially to European islands. By forming this intergroup, islands are finally on the agenda of the European Parliament. Our goal is to tackle the challenges islands are facing, and challenges are many, including limited accessibility, isolation, high dependence on a narrow range of economic activities, and very small internal markets. Furthermore, the island's small size means that they have few resources to offer, and they need to use these resources in a sensible and sustainable manner with much higher degree of urgency than in a larger mainland regions. For example, one of the projects I'm actively supporting deals with the water scarcity. Isolated by the sea, islanders have been forced to self-rely and seek sustainable, clever solution to many obstacles. And water is one of the most necessary sources to the entrepreneurs in islands. Water Saving Challenge project will gather eight islands from four European Union member states, Croatia, France, Greece, and Ireland. They will use their experience and knowledge to develop models of solving water scarcity by affecting consumption, not supply. The goal of the project is to show how to save water, decrease consumption by using innovative technological solutions, and changing everyday habits and routines. Different islands came up with different solutions. We are now bringing some of them together to combine their experience and create sustainable models of water management. The idea is to save both water and money. Included islands will set a benchmark not only for other islands, but for coastal communities as well. It's time that in solving our continental problems, we start learning from islands and give them opportunity to teach us. So far, 
we have been listening to islanders' problems, but rarely, if at all, to islanders' solutions. That's why I'm particularly happy to support the opinion of Ms. Mapetiu, another islander, who offers many concrete proposals on what can be done for our islands primary through entrepreneurship. It comes as a great follow-up to the resolution of European Parliament on islands adopted last February. The parliamentary resolutions means two important things. First, it shows the Parliament recognizes the importance of islands and the need to put islands issue higher on the European Union agenda. And second, the Parliament shows that it understands that ongoing cohesion policy is failing islands and that serious amendments are needed for the post-2020 strategy. All 19 points of the resolution confirm that Parliament wants specific, well-thought and long-term activities and not just formal changes. We, in the Parliament, don't want the word island simply appear more often in EU documents. We want adapted and dedicated policies that will give tangible results. Speaking of tangible results, I'm excited that preparatory action project on strengthening cooperation on climate action among islands that I proposed with two other colleagues has been adopted and approved and allocated with 2 million euros in this year's European Union budget. The objective of this preparatory action is to make island front runners on clean energy transition and showcase solution to this end at the European level. The ultimate aim is to help islands to move to the production of electricity from local clean energy sources and to become autonomous in energy supply to the greatest possible extent. Within the action, the Commission will work in close cooperation with core member states and island's local authorities with the aim of implementing the initiative forward. A European Energy Islands Forum will be established in order to showcase advances, encourage networking, share experience and transfer knowledge and know-how to the islands themselves. I am thankful this opinion also recognizes our efforts. Going back to the content of this opinion, Madam Rapporteur rightly emphasizes that there is much more to achieve success than to have competitive product of good quality. Even through that is already hard enough to achieve with additional cost borne because of the island location. Entrepreneurs on islands are faced with a lack of R&D capacities. Technology tailored to islands appropriate funding and qualified workers due to the size of the population of islands and a high degree of immigration from the islands to inland areas. This is why flexibility is needed when developing public policy to boost island entrepreneurship. It's a striking fact that island's GDP amounts to 79.2 percentage of European Union average. Clearly, being more than 20 percentage below average national GDP has additional implications for island's inhabitants. Examples are countless. Every imaginable situation on the islands is augmented by its insularity. In addition to these much needed and well-reasoned corrections to European Union regulations, there is also an understanding that executive branch should be amended in addition to legislation. At the same time, we have, we have to clearly and loudly say how legal possibilities of TFEU is particularly of Articles 174 and 175 have not been adequately used. That means there is a big work ahead of us and this opinion is a step in the right direction. This opinion has a lot in common with already mentioned resolution of European Parliament and this should not come as a surprise. This opinion shows that Parliament and the European Committee of Regions are on the same page. We have a common understanding on issues islands are facing with the European Union and how to solve them. Comparing the two documents, one sees the resolution and this new opinion have almost 100% overlap when it comes to what should the European Union do to correct the situation. It reduces to the idea that special situation of islands cannot remain 
an empty phrase, but should be taken into account as a correcting element of existing EU policies. Most notably, they mention in the COR wording, many obstacles that are specific to Ireland's development are not captured by using GDP as an indicator. Therefore, suggests broadening the range of indicators used in the context of cohesion policy in order to more accurately determine island socioeconomic circumstances and attractiveness or in the parliament wording to take into account besides GDP other statistical indicators that can reflect the economic and social vulnerability rising from national permanent handicaps. To conclude, being born on the island and raised by the sea throughout my entire professional career, I have always admired the deep and the bittersweet bond between islanders and the sea that connects and separates them from the world at the same time. Every island is a stunning cosmos for itself, a unique community worth preserving and fighting for, a mission I believe all of us are happily committed to. Only together we can deliver inclusive policies for inclusive islands, and I'm looking forward to our future cooperation. Thank you very much.